If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and let, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guide you, to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He's quoting, the, the devil is quoting now from the Bible, Psalm 91 verses 11 and, and 12. And we'll talk about that uh, in our lesson. He quotes it almost verbatim. Uh, he leaves out one phrase, I'm not going to deal with that, but uh, he, he, know, he knows the scriptures. Verse 12, and Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Well, the account of uh, Christ's uh, temptation follows with cruel logic, Luke's brief description of his baptism. Uh, God in heaven had spoken, uh, declaring this man, Jesus, to be his own beloved son in whom he was well pleased. And now the devil meets up with him to test the claim and create a, a fissure between the two. Uh, twice he challenges him, if you are the son of God, or perhaps better, since you are the son of God, Prove it. These three temptations were real temptations. One may say, uh, Jesus is God. How, how can God be tempted? But he wasn't tempted in his divine, in his divine nature. It, it was true that he was God. But remember, uh, he had emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2, and reckoning uh, this wonderful reality as a thing to be grasped for dear life, but rather voluntarily handed over to his heavenly father for his care and keeping while he took upon himself a human nature. It was in his sinless human nature that he was tempted. We, we may even say with all conviction that he was tempted beyond what any normal sinful person has experienced. The author of Hebrews uh, reminds us in Hebrews 4.15 that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. That's a very comforting verse. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with us. He's been tempted just like uh, we have. Our lives are lives, of, unfortunately, of temptation. <laughs> Every day, uh, every a time of life is a time of life of, of, of temptations. But what that verse means practically is that Christ endured temptations at a level you and I will never know. Uh, because our sad reality is that too often when we face temptation, we eventually give in and yield to the temptation and sin. But Christ endured the highest voltage of temptation because he never gave into it. He received the full amount. The breaker never flipped. He absorbed, he absorbed it all. The nature of his temptations is explained by that reality, to, to abandon the route of the sacrifice demanded of him. And, of which that Philippians 2 passage uh, speaks 
and take a shortcut to the glory he once had to regain the crown without the cross. In this way, I think we can understand the temptation of Christ as something of a dual temptation. Follow me here. Uh, a dual temptation, uh, assuredly, uh, from the devil, but also a testing from his heavenly Father. Uh, to borrow from Dan's quotation two Sundays ago from Griffith Thomas, you'll remember it when I say it, Satan tempts to bring out the bad, God tests to bring out the good. It was a full bore tempting and a full bore testing. And Luke's account explains for us how he was able to escape the devil's temptations while meeting successively the tests God allowed. At the same time, it provides lessons for us. Uh, first, that we must know God's word and then that we should obey it, or then that we should believe it, and finally that we should obey it. Well, Luke gives us, uh, in very short order at the beginning of chapter 4, the setting of the temptations. At his baptism, the Spirit had come upon him in bodily form like a dove, remember, anointing him. And from that point on, Jesus was full of the Spirit. And Luke reminds us again, as he went into the wilderness, he was full of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. So departing from the Jordan Valley and the place of his baptism, he entered what Luke describes as the wilderness, where he was led about by the Holy Spirit. So between uh, the, the, the land there in uh, Israel, uh, between the populated areas of, of the, the hill country of Judea and the Dead Sea, uh, there was this inhospitable desert land, uh, a desolate, uninhabited wilderness known as Jeshimon, uh, the, desol the, the desolation. And surely there's symbolism in that, think about it. Uh, Moses had led Israel for 40 years uh, in uh, the wilderness where they were tested. They failed there. While Moses uh, met with God up on Mount Horeb, Elijah later would travel for 40 days uh, to go to that same uh, mount. God had led Israel into the wilderness in order to test them. And their failure uh, was monumental and numbingly continual. We've read these. I like teaching this class because I look out upon you and I know you're so familiar. You've, you've read them over and over again. And uh, it's almost tiresome. Uh, to read those passages and how Israel failed over and over and over again. Well, here for 40 days, Jesus would have had plenty of time to meditate on these things and, and ponder the work that he was now to undertake. Uh, he was to navigate the human experience in a way the first man, Adam, had been unable. But this wilderness was the opposite setting from where Adam had dwelt in Eden, in paradise. And as the last Adam, Jesus's temptations would be infinitely more dangerous. But whether the devil tempted him throughout this 40 day period or only at the end, we're really not told, but Luke tells us that he ate nothing during those 40 days, he ate nothing. And reports from people who have uh, fasted for long periods of time describe a kind of respite from hunger that eventually sets in after this initial deprivation of, of, of fasting, but it doesn't persist. persist. And soon a, a ravishing hunger comes uh, when Jesus' 40 days were completed, that hunger set in. It was real, and it bullied its way into Jesus' consciousness. It was then that the devil approached Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone uh, to become bread. The wilderness uh, is 
was uh, full uh, of stones. And perhaps uh, the devil pointed to one particular stone, or he might even have picked up a stone and held it out to Jesus. And Jesus, with his hunger uh, raging and knowing that that would have been a simple thing uh, for him to do, to use the same supernatural power with which he had created uh, the universe, the cosmos, uh, at this moment, uh, a mere piece of bread would have been a piece of cake. Uh, Satan tempted Jesus to stave off this desperate hunger by taking things into his own hands and satisfying his need by his own means and without regard to the will of his father. It was a physical temptation. F forgive a simple illustration. Uh, I came in from exercising yesterday. For some reason, I was famished. And there was a slice of watermelon in, in the refrigerator for little Ruthie, who was staying with us. And I couldn't resist. It was so good. That red watermelon. So this was a physical temptation, but more, it was a, a spiritual test for Christ had come to earth as a man to do only one thing, and that capsulized by that expression, to do the will of his Father. For Jesus, there were more, far more important things than food. Uh, later, he would say in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. There was, there was something more important to Jesus than meeting his earthly physical needs. And so he answered the devil in verse 4, quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Now, Matthew, uh, in his gospel, he covers the temptation uh, by the devil as well. And he gives us the fuller uh, quotation. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, you know this, but it's still remarkably profound. Facing these temptations... Uh, Jesus meets each one with a quotation from the scriptures, a quotation from the word of God. And interestingly, each passage, each scripture he cites comes from the same section of the book of Deuteronomy relating to Israel's time spent in the wilderness when God tested them and they repeatedly uh, failed. Moses, go back into Deuteronomy, Moses wanted the people to know that God had led them there for the purpose of revealing their heart to them. God does that with us as well. He puts us into different places and we fail and he reveals to us our, our woeful inadequacy before him, our desperate uh, need uh, for his power, for his sanctification, for the work of the spirit within us. So that's what Moses is, uh, is telling the people. Uh, it's not in the good times, after all, that our faith is proven, but in the fearful challenges of life. Israel hungered there, and then they grumbled. But God provided. God provided manna. He provided a, a quail for them. He was able to provide for them in ways they could not imagine, but that they could not believe that. But where Israel failed, Jesus shows us the way to victory. Uh, he chose not to take matters into his own hands, but instead to depend solely on God and to be obedient to his word. He would not surrender. Here was the temptation. He would not surrender the humanity of his incarnation in order to fulfill a human need, no matter how real it seemed he remained instead the perfect, obedient man. Well, you and I face the same temptations every day and at every season of our life. 
unconsciously perhaps, but naturally determining to fix the difficulties and challenges of our lives in our own way, uh, setting total dependence on God over to the side, uh, taking the reins, I'm using every figure I can think of, taking the reins in our own hands and barreling forward to attain what we want by hook or by crook. All because we will not trust the Lord to be the ultimate and final solution to our very real human needs. Like Jacob, think about Jacob. Uh, Jacob, who had received the promises of God, what a blessed man he was. Uh, God had chosen him above his older brother for no reason whatsoever to be found in him, uh, that he would inherit the birthright and against all odds received the blessing of the firstborn, uh, yet he could not rest in those promises, but instead he schemed and plotted and deceived his brother and his father in order to help God along just a little bit. So, so he would gain through his own devices what was already his by God's word. But like Jacob, you and I, often faithlessly abandon trust in God and we strike out on our own. Maybe you remember a story Dr. Waltke told here uh, several years ago now. Uh, he told about one of his students uh, who was really struggling. Uh, he needed a job, he couldn't find one. Uh, life was very difficult and he ultimately confessed uh, to Dr. Waltke that he'd, he'd found a job, uh, a, a bartender in a, in a bar. Not exactly the image a budding minister of the gospel should have taken on, let's, really, let's be honest, that's not the job uh, to take. And when Dr. Waltke gently confronted him about it, the young man responded, but I have to eat. And Dr. Waltke said, no, you do not have to eat. Uh, God's promises had not failed. His word was still the young man's stronghold and he would guard him and he would provide for him but he had yielded to the temptation to abandon obedience and submission to God and turned away from his ways to his own. I actually knew a guy in seminary that was his job, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Jesus resisted the temptation to turn away from his father's ways and, and yield to the devil's ways. He knew God's word and he acted on it. He knew it and he acted on it. So the devil uh, tried a different tactic, hoping to tempt Jesus for a second time in verses five through eight. Somewhat strangely here, um, Luke has arranged these last two temptations in a different order than Matthew uh, did. Uh, one, uh, you, 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 there's been a different, Matthew's, or Luke's second one is Matthew's third, Matthew's second one is Luke's third, and various explanations. So they, so put, they, they put them in different order, uh, and, and different explanations have been set forth there, some of them very clever. I won't go through each one of those, but you can find them easily. Uh, one sample suggested is that Luke was the one that rearranged the testings in order to have the devil, in a way, finally resort to quoting scripture after Jesus had quoted scripture uh, twice uh, before. Uh, that's a possibility. But the most uh, likely explanation is that Luke wished to highlight Jesus's presence at the temple. So he placed the temptation set at the temple as last in his telling. If you think about it, Luke's gospel, I read this, then I went and looked. Luke's gospel begins in the temple and it ends uh, in the temple. In chapter 24, verse 53, where uh, Luke tells us that his followers were continually in the temple 
uh, praising God. And so it may be that Luke found it fitting to conclude, to conclude his account of Christ's temptations uh, at the temple as well. But Luke writes in verse 5 that the devil led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Matthew adds that he led him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms with their glory. In a vision, most likely, for he says that it all happened in a moment of time. So in, a, in this vision, uh, the devil put on display uh, the, the entire world in, in all its pomp. Uh, what that consisted of, we can, we can only imagine. They were kingdoms, he says, so perhaps what Jesus saw were all the seemingly unconquerable empires that ruled mankind throughout history, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Roman Empire, uh, the British Empire, uh, all the Western power that has held sway for these many recent centuries, including our own American dominance, and, and any of the future might still hold in store. Maybe that's what uh, he, sh he showed them, but these, these kingdoms uh, were kingdoms of the inhabited earth. That's the word there for world. It's the world that we live in. And uh, so surely the devil uh, tempted him with all the delights to be found in this world. I do believe this. Uh, one thinks of the iconic destinations we might wish we could visit. Uh, Paris and the Eiffel Tower, London and, and Big Ben, uh, New York City, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, the, you know, the Mediterranean Riviera, the mountain vistas of, of Colorado or the, or the Alps. And within each of uh, those places, the very exclusive neighborhoods that reek with power and privilege and, 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 and overconsumption. In a moment of time, uh, the devil appealed to Jesus' human senses. He was a human being. Maybe some of you struggle with material things. Uh, the devil tried that route. Jesus was a human being. And he, t he tells him, the, the devil told him, it's all been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. That's a comment befitting the father of lies. Uh, but it also uh, reflects a certain truth. Three times in the, in the Gospel of John, uh, John quotes Jesus as calling Satan the ruler of this world. And John himself, in 1 John 5, uh, verse uh, 19, I think it is, yeah, 1 John 5, 19, uh, says of him that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But his sovereignty over the world was and is only a limited one, uh, granted to him for a time by the true sovereign of the earth. It was only for a brief time, and it was always subject to God's supervision. As we often say, the Lord holds the devil on a short leash. That's, that's the truth. That's, that's what the Bible uh, presents. Well, keep in mind also, uh, the first gospel message, that one in, in Genesis chapter uh, 3, speaks of his ultimate end anyway. The seed of the, one, of the woman will one day crush uh, him, will one day destroy him. And Psalm 2 describes the Lord sitting in the heavens laughing at his braggadocia ways because he had already installed his king. He's there. He's on the throne, and the Lord laughs. How could the devil have possibly thought that such an offer would appeal to Jesus? <laughs> He's not dumb, apparently. Well, it was because it appealed to him. He was already intoxicated with his imagined authority and the glory he was sure 
uh, came with it. And, and here was the side benefit that came with it, this twisted satisfaction he derived from flaunting it before his enemy as if the Son of God was somehow forced now to negotiate with him. But still, as we consider Jesus before him, we, we, we cannot assume the devil's promise held out no appeal. Uh, Jesus would inherit the kingdoms of the world. He had created them, and now for a time the devil seemed to have power over them. But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had a plan in place. They had a plan in place, a covenant between them to secure all creation for an in eternal inheritance belonging to them. Uh, but here was, here's, here's the temptation. Here was a shortcut. Uh, we all can appreciate shortcuts. I've never met a shortcut I didn't <laughs> grab hold of. And this, this one would have been especially appealing to Jesus for the hazards it would avoid. The temptation to him was to take the easy way to kingship, and most significantly to avoid the immense suffering of the cross. Again, to gain the crown without the cross. All he had to do, and this is verse 7 now, was to simply bow down and, and worship the devil. But for him to have done that would have meant turning his back on his calling, rejecting the plan. Uh, the effects would be disastrous, as the commentator Walter Liefeld bluntly expressed it. Had Jesus accepted the devil's offer, our salvation would have been impossible. The kingdom Jesus sought was different from what the devil uh, was offering. The devil's kingdom was precisely what he was displaying, a palace built on sand that would not stand the demands of the ages. Jesus' kingdom would last forever and be filled with loving, loyal, grateful, and most importantly, upright and righteous fellow heirs of the grace of God. That's what his kingdom was going to consist of. Jesus met this second temptation not, not in the garb of the impeccable and exalted divine Son of God, but in the weak flesh of the incarnate Son. I think it's important for us to really grasp that. He met the temptation in this, in this, in this. That's how he met the the temptation. As a real man, he gave the devil an answer. Verse 8, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. His loyalty was pure and unbreakable. He knew what God had written and he would obey no matter the circumstances. Well, this drama is played out almost daily in the average Christian's life. The Christian life is filled with disappointment, frustration, suffering, even persecution. We have respites from that, but they don't last that long, really, in the scheme of things. We are, are tempted throughout the difficult times of life to give up on the invisible and devote ourselves to the tangible glories of this world. But the Lord demands our soul worship and devotion. He calls us to choose between the two. Don't we fail so often? The third temptation is described in verses 9 through 12, the third temptation. For this one, the devil uh, led Jesus to Jerusalem, where he had him stand, Luke writes, on the pinnacle of the temple. There's no way for us to know for sure or whether even uh, he did this in a physical way. Perhaps it was 
in a vision, uh, but most agree that the, the place described was the highest point of the royal portico overlooking the Kidron Valley, uh, said to be at that time 450 feet or so from top to the ground. Josephus described it as a dizzying height. So there they are. And here the devil challenged once again Jesus' sonship. This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. <clears throat> now he challenges that sonship again giving the gist of his challenge, something more like, since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, rather than if you are the Son of God. Since you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Since you have this special relationship with him, that you are his son in a way that nobody else is, prove it. Here's the opportunity uh, to prove it. But the challenge did not... Uh, end with the mere tempting as before, this time having experienced the son's deft use of scripture to overcome him, the devil now quotes it himself. Uh, he quotes from Psalm 91, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He quotes it out of context, of course, a, a favorite tool of the unbelieving uh, critic who's desperate to get a leg up on the argument. In the psalm itself, the psalmist is expressing confidence that the Most High will be his fortress in times of trouble, uh, for that is how God deals with his faithful ones, uh, using figurative language to describe how his angels uh, guard the faithful and bear them up so that they won't uh, be trampled down so that they're, they're not harmed. Now, slyly, if you went back in your Bibles to Psalm 91, very slyly, the devil stopped at that 12th verse of Psalm 91, uh, apparently not really wanting to utter the sentiment of verse 13 that says the young lion and the serpent, the psalmist would trample down. Perhaps he hoped Jesus was not that familiar with, with Psalm 91. But uh, here with Jesus, uh, the devil twists the meaning of the verses by interpreting it as an invitation to test God in order to verify that the promise is true. Well, Jesus knew he had to do the power to do at this point in his life, Jesus knew he had the power to do what the devil was tempting him uh, to do. So we may say that this uh, was a temptation in his humanity to shut the devil up once and for all. And thus, as most of us humans would wish, win the argument. I'm big on winning the argument. <laughs> But that's, that's what most of us would do. But that would be to misconstrue God's word and presume on his grace. It would be to test God by daring him to indulge in what was a foolish action. Jesus saw straight through it. It was pointless and unnecessary. If he had agreed, he would have revealed a lack of faith on his part, but he refused to substitute presumption for faith. Instead, he would not dare hold his heavenly father in contempt and toy with his word. And so, as before, uh, he showed the devil the proper use of scripture. Now quoting from Deuteronomy 6:16, 6, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Remember the context. Uh, that was what Israel had done. They had tested God. That's what they did in, in the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness. He must have spent considerable time, not must have, he spent considerable time studying those passages of scripture. He knew them inside and out. He knew them like no professor of Old Testament uh, or, or of the Pentateuch 
uh, or of De Deuteronomy. He knew them inside and, and out. And so he would have marveled, as we often do, at their persistent failures in the face of God's testing. And now he would conduct himself in an upright way in their place for them, joining with them. In a sense, he would succeed where they had failed. And the lesson again uh, for us is to hold firmly to God's truth as found in his word and don't play games of one-upmanship with it. But with this third temptation, the devil was finished. He had been soundly defeated and now was the time to retreat. Luke states in verse 13 that he left Jesus until an opportune time. Jesus had been confronted with questions that he had to answer. What sort of Messiah was he to be? He had power. Would he use it for his own personal needs outside of his father's direction? Would he force the hand of world powers and, and bring in his kingdom by supernatural means? Would he use his power to put on a show uh, with pointless but spectacular uh, miracles? And all these questions he answered. But we know that the temptations to the Lord to quit his mission would continue, culminating in that dreadful night in the Garden of Gethsemane when he pleaded with God, but with obedient anguish, he got up and made his way to meet the arresting party. In his study on the temptations of Christ, Leon Morris reminds us there is no freedom from temptation in this life that was not for Jesus and there's not for us. There's no freedom from temptations. Peter warned, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, if be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Beware the opportune time. Well, I want to close with some brief observations. There is a way of escape from the temptations of the devil, or for that matter, from the temptations that come from within our own sinful uh, hearts. The Apostle Paul exhorts us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide uh, the way of escape so that you'll not, so that you'll be able to endure it. Uh, Jesus has shown the way of escape to us. Know the word of God. That's not an overnight thing. Some of you are younger in your life. It's not an overnight thing. It takes years of repetition and study and prayer. Uh, know the word of God. You, you never reach an age where you know it as well as you want to know it. Just keep at it. Keep at it. Second, believe it. Hold to it and nurture it in your heart, and third, obey it. It's that simple. <laughs> your word, the psalmist wrote, I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Yesterday, we commemorated the 20 year anniversary of 9 11. There were many fresh reminders of the horror of that day, alongside the reality that something like that could happen to us. Uh, again, uh, the terrorist attacks, attacks serve to remind us that the political powers of this world cannot completely protect us from tragedy like that, from danger. Uh, 
So we pray that another attack like that will not occur, but even if one does, here's the lesson for us uh, on the 20th anniversary, even if one does, we have hope. We Christians have hope, the hope of life after death, even uh, because uh, the Lord Jesus was faithful to the end. I was reminded of that yesterday. Uh, our hope, I was reminded of hope in this, that our hope hinged on a way, in a way, on Jesus' triumph in that desolate wilderness, face to face with the enemy. He prevailed so that you and I might live. No matter what happens to us physically, you know later Jesus is going to say uh, there in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And uh, everyone who lives and believes in me will live even if he dies. Uh, we have uh, this week uh, been told that Inska Zanvliet, who sat right over there, uh, year after year after year after year after year has, has gone to be with the Lord. And we know where she is. Uh, we know exactly uh, where that woman is, our, our beloved friend and sister in Christ. The reason she did is because Christ persevered he did not fail, he did not falter, he held faithful to the end. Our salvation wasn't lost, it was, is not impossible. Our Savior persevered and we are the church, uh, the fruit of that valiant and, and stalwart obedience. Praise the Lord for that. Father, thank you for uh, an obedient Savior. May he be uh, an example to us, it's okay uh, for us to talk about him being our example. Uh, may we be like him and know your word and, and uh, hold to it, trust in it, and obey it. Thank you uh, that he obeyed all the way to the cross. We rejoice in that. In his name, amen.